Okay, hello everyone. Um, I've seen a, a few of you at some earlier presentations and um, glad that you're here today as well. Welcome to AI and Accessibility, Benefits and Challenges. So this is going to be a general overview of the AI tools available for ensuring accessibility as well as um, document accessing documents from the user's perspective as well. And um, my name is Linda Sobleski. I'm a learning designer at Learning Design Services here at UMass Boston. Part of my role is as an accessibility specialist. So I believe in the impact of, of um, AI on accessibility and how important it is to, to talk about it and make sure everybody is aware of, of the tools available and, and um, and that they could be using them. So that said, today we're going to talk about the importance uh, of AI for accessibility. We'll share some uh, statistics as well as uh, just some information here and there throughout the presentation. Um, and two components of AI accessibility, the tools for accessing materials as well as creating the materials. And then we'll talk a little about benefits and challenges. And I welcome you to share your ideas throughout the presentation and chat. Ellen will let me know if there are any questions or, or thoughts to include. And um, I am curious though, before we start, um, so do any of you use AI to access your materials? If you do, if you wanna just put in chat what you use, that would that'd be great. Um, Nothing maybe that I'm aware some... of, but <laughs> okay. Um, or do you use AI to create the material? And if not, we're going to show you how maybe you already are and didn't realize it. <laughs> and um, moving forward, I, I just want to also call attention to um, the importance of, of AI for accessibility and how. Um, the, our university states it quite well as student equity, access, and success. And um, we all know that our purpose at UMass is to foster student success. And, um, and one step in doing that is ensuring that there's equity in, in the digital materials that, that we're producing, whether they're for instruction or for our, our fellow staff or faculty um, or administration. Um, important to ensure that, um, especially for our website, what we're putting out there is accessible. AI tools help level the playing field for many people, and they'll increase accessibility, minimize barriers um, to learning or understanding the materials that, that you're creating for everyone. And um, we'll talk more about that momentarily. But before we do, I just wanted to share this. According to the US Census's, Census American Community Survey, the ACS, in 2021, 13% of the civilian population reported having some form of disability. And another important fact is my colleagues at the Ross Center tell me that since 2020, the numbers of students using their services has increased significantly. And um, there were 850 students at UMass Boston at, um, using the Ross Center for Disability Services in the spring. And um, given that, uh, we, were, we were talking about that uh, just the other day, and that could be a combination of the increase in mental health diagnoses since the beginning of the pandemic, and perhaps the increase in online instruction taking place that wasn't taking place before. So, um, so that's just something to keep in mind as, as we are talking about these tools and, and using them. So there are many types of AI used for accessibility, but one of the more frequently used is text-to-speech, and that is used as a screen reader. You might have heard of this referred to as JAWS or MBDA. Um, there are a lot of operating systems and software which now have built-in screen reading capabilities. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. More students are finding the benefits of using this technology beyond just those who are blind or visually impaired. 
so this means that our digital content even more so needs to be designed so that it can be read by a screen reader and read by anyone regardless of how they're navigating it. Uh, one of the older tools uh, is the Kurzweil 3000. Um, it was invented by Ray Kurzweil, the founding father of text-to-speech and optical character recognition. Pretty cool guy, really wonderful inventor. In fact, the last I heard he was working for Google and responsible for overseeing the team that ensured those automated responses to your email. Like, you know how when you, you get an email in and you have choices to say, uh, oh, great, thanks. You know, Ray built that and his team. So that's just a little interesting fact. Um, so getting back to, uh, to text-to-speech, it's designed to assist individuals with or, or the, the Kurzweil re, uh, reader was designed to assist individuals with learning disabilities, reading difficulties, visual impairments, so they can access and comprehend written content more effectively. And um, the, the, the Kurzweil, I mean, it incorporates text-to-speech, optical character recognition that we all refer to as OCR. It's, it's basically where, um, the text could be read and understood. But often, uh, just a little uh, side note about OCR. Um, when, if you're using Adobe Acrobat, um, is it called Pro or DC now? I'm not even sure. But if you're using a, Adobe Acrobat Pro, um, as soon as you open a new file in Adobe Acrobat Pro, it will ask you if you want it to read the text for you. And it will convert your document in most cases, to optical character recognition, unless it's just a really big photo <laughs> that's really hard to understand. And, you know, it could only do so much, but if the text is easily legible, it will, it has the capability of converting to optical character recognition. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, Studying, it, 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 the Kurzweil is also used for like st as a t studying tool, offers highlighting and note taking and vocabulary study aids. So it, it has many, many opportunities for, for students. Audiobooks are another option uh, for anyone who has difficulty reading text or for one reason or another. I honestly prefer audiobooks anymore over reading. I, I tend to just almost fall asleep when I start reading a book. Um, <laughs> some are recorded, the, uh, these, some of these audiobooks are recorded by the author or live people, but others use text-to-speech technology to provide this alternative for um, access to a book. So that's uh, just a little something to know. Speech-to-text recognition um, includes auto-captioning, auto transcription, note-taking, and even, you know, what we use day in and day out between Alexa, Siri, and Google. What is it? Hey, Google, you have to say for Google. I don't have Google products. Jenny, you're muted. Well, for Google, actually, I don't know what it is for Google. I, I have a friend who, yeah, who uses Samsung hey products. Yeah. And he says, hey, Google. <laughs> right, instead of hey, Siri. Yeah. Hey, Siri. Yeah. Yeah, so hey Siri, hey Google, or you know Alexa, or whatever you want to call it. I said Alexa. hey Siri, and now it turned on. I know. Well, you know, I just set up a new uh, Alexa device, and you can now one of the options is Alexa, Echo, or Ziggy, or computer. Hmm. And oh, see, it's talking to me now. <laughs> She's like, hmm, I don't know that one. Anyway. Um, so it's important to, important to remember that with these tools that accuracy generally is 85% or so because none of, us, none of us speak perfectly. None of us enunciate just perfectly. And things are, are misinterpreted and that could impact someone's understanding of the materials. So it's really important to edit your captions and make sure that, that they are correct and provide equity for students. Transcription working similarly to auto captioning, same tool just provides a, a whole transcription of 
the um, the captions put in one page. And when you're using a video, it is important to either, well, not either, but make sure you have captioning, but you should also provide the transcript. It's, it's a good practice so that people, your, your potential viewers have the option to, to navigate the way that works best for them at that time that they need to navigate through your material. So that said, Microsoft has a number of AI tools for accessibility. There are tools for the intended recipient, such as Immersive Reader, which uses text to speech, Translator, which uses language identification, um, Dictation, speech to text, Live Captions, also speech to text, and the Accessibility Checker, which is my favorite. <laughs> and Adobe has an assess accessibility checker that is used in Acrobat, InDesign. I'm not sure what other Adobe products it's used in, but those are the ones I use the most. Anthology Ally can be used in either Blackboard, Canvas, or on the web. However, we at UMass only have it available in Blackboard at this time. So it's important to know that. So what I want to do is to actually focus on what Microsoft has to, to offer in the area of tools and um, and share those with you and hopefully uh, whet your appetite for using them or encouraging the use of them um, in others. But before we start on Microsoft's website, they uh, have this graphic on why accessible learning matters. And they state that 72% of classrooms have students with individual education needs. 20% of students are impacted by dyslexia. That's a pretty high number or percentage. And 84% 84 teacher, 84 of teachers say it's impossible to achieve equity in education without accessible learning tools. So we have these tools and you know they're at our fingertips. We just need to go find them, use them, and and hopefully they, they will improve the quality of um, materials for everybody and the, the accessibility of materials. And Microsoft has answered. I mean, they've come up with this immersive reader and um, that they, the, the immersive reader that they offer helps improve reading comprehension, engagement, and confidence while supporting people with learning differences and as well as new language learners. And it can employ text decoding for students with dyslexia and other learning differences, utilizes individual word or whole text translate translation. And I couldn't believe it's a hundred plus languages. Can you like, wow. And has a simple interface that helps reduce distraction, which is great. Um, it is also available in Word, OneNote, Outlook, and Teams, as well as they claim and more, but I'm not sure which more they're speaking of. I have to investigate that further. Has, has anyone used uh, the Immersive Reader? No, Jenny, you haven't? It looks really interesting, though. Um, I don't. I don't work with traditional students, and none of them are going to use this. But I worked with dyslexic students in the past, and like I can't tell this text is too small, but like, mm -hmm. is the is the purple nouns or something? Anyway, it, it's interesting. Yeah, I think it is. No, it's not. Let's see, geography landforms. It might be. It might be landforms features. Yes, looks like it. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And it, there's not a lot of great contrast in this example either. I'm surprised on that. <laughs> it seems like they like every every piece of text would fail contrast. So yeah. you know, this is just that particular image that Microsoft used on their page, but I'm sure you can adjust, like it says, it shows on the right where um, you see the, the sliders on the right here. Mm -hmm. You can um, turn this off or on as far as what you're calling attention to. And you could also change the colors to be the colors that work best for you as far as um, 
what you identify as, you know, if you want to use blue all the time for nouns or <laughs> different colors, um, you can you can change those up. So Microsoft Translator um, has the potential to improve communication between anyone using your materials, not just students, students, teachers, administrators, parents, um, you know, anyone that you're creating materials for. And it translates presentations in real time. I have not used this and I want to try it, but uh, I, I thought that was pretty cool that it, it is used for, I guess, it looks like it's being used in, in, uh, in PowerPoint in this case. Um, and it bridges the language gaps within multiple multi-device conversations available for free on Android and iOS. So I think what Microsoft assumed is that the majority of people who are using translation are using it on their phones. I know people um, often are using their phones to to look things up more so than maybe their desktops. I'm not sure. And so it's available on Android and iOS. So when it says it translates, is it Pardon? is it is it doing that? So it's AI. So it's it's not a person who's it's, it's AI. Yeah, it's Whoa. it's not. Yeah, I yeah, don't think incredible. that would be a huge staffing issue. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right, right, because Microsoft would have to provide that. Yeah, I was wondering if it just created some sort of interface where, like, you could hear a translator over the person who's actually presenting. You know what I mean? Like, but yeah. Well, you know, we should we should test it out if you want to schedule a consult and we could we could test it out. That would be, I would love to do that as well. Um, you know, a lot of times with these tools like translator, dictation, I personally don't have a need to use them in my day in and day out. So I haven't done a lot of testing with them, but I'd, look, I'd be happy to have a reason to, you know, go through and, and just sit some time up, apart to do some testing for anyone who's interested in doing that. So Microsoft Dictation as well is another tool. Um, if, if someone break, breaks a hand or an arm or has a more permanent physical disability, Dictation can provide multiple ways to write, improve your writing skills, continue with your writing skills, even if physically you are unable to do that. And um, I, didn't, I think that's, that is awesome. Some of the things it can do it could refine and review dictated text with editor. It has its own editor. You can um, find advanced spelling and grammar checks, get word suggestions with read aloud. And it is available in Word, PowerPoint, OneNote, and Outlook. So that's that's pretty cool. So Ellen could be, you know, going for a walk and dictate some instruction. <laughs> <laughs> or some instructional ideas or like you could you could be somewhere and you know pull open your office 365 and and um jot down your 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 information that, that you want to dictate to your system so that said this was this is another lesser known on my part that um that I like, I haven't really used this as much because I'm not a big Teams user, but live captions and transcriptions are available through Microsoft as well. And, and primarily available in PowerPoint and Teams. From my perspective, I tend to use PowerPoint whether to, to deliver a live presentation or maybe I upload it to VoiceThread and then narrate, or I, I haven't done a lot of my narration within PowerPoint and automatically played a presentation to to use the captions as much but I'm going to be exploring that in the near future but uh, so it's it's powered by Microsoft automatic speech recognition technology compliant with FERPA which is really great so if you have students in your your class um, it's not going to identify students by name 
it, it, it'll, it'll, I believe, curtail that, that so that it, whatever captioning it's producing is, is FERPA compliant. And, um, and yet another tool in our toolbox. It's like, wow, very cool. But honestly, the one I use the most is the accessibility checker. And I'm going to take you through so just two steps in using the accessibility checker and then give you some information on what it provides. And then we'll talk a little more about it. So your first step is if you're in Microsoft Word or PowerPoint, you go to the review tab at the top of your screen, and then you'll see a check accessibility option. You click on check accessibility. So what will happen then is it will pull up a, an accessibility check pane on to the right side of your document that looks very similar to this one that I'm showing right here. And it will list your errors, your warnings, and so on. And that said, there are three types of issues, errors, warnings, and tips. And Microsoft's support website will describe them um, in this way. An error is content that makes the document difficult or impossible to read and understand for people with disabilities. So it's a, a must fix, right? The warning content that in most, but not all cases, makes the document difficult to understand for people with disabilities. So it's a very likely that you should fix that. <laughs> and then a tip, which is content that people with disabilities could understand, but could be presented in a different way to improve the user's experience. I like to try to act upon them all. But if you're in a rush and you need to decide what, and you have this list of things that you have to fix, go for the errors and the warnings and the tips. Any questions about the accessibility checker and how it works or anything? Is anyone, you, do you use it regularly? Um, I think I've only remembered to use it a couple of times and I don't remember the specifics, so it's not very helpful, but um, I want to get into the habit of doing it just to see what are the things that pulls out mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Um, well, you and, know, and Jenny, doing that is going to be educational for you as well, because once mm -hmm. you start getting these errors and then you realize that, okay, I should have considered this when I was building the document, your errors will be less and less. So the more you use it, the less you will need to use it, but you should check your document with it, but the less maybe errors that will come up when you do. And that's that's something I think is really great. Mm -hmm. I think just the mindset of the accessibility checker is probably of greatest benefit um, to people initially. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and so I'm guessing that you're probably wondering, okay, where is, where can this be used, right? So Microsoft also puts together this chart of yeses and nos for operating systems. And um, as you can see in Windows and Mac, the accessibility checker is available in all Microsoft products except for Sway. And I learned right before this presentation, quite honestly, that Sway is a newsletter. Uh, program that we don't have here. So we don't have to worry about that at this time. Um, I've not seen Sway before. I mean, we have a different newsletter product that we use on campus. And um, in your iOS and Android devices, there's a hard no on all of those <laughs> for availability. So it's important to keep in mind that if you do often create your documents on the fly using your mobile devices. Try to set aside a little time to get on your desktop and do that accessibility check if you can. <laughs> Does it seem reasonable, Jenny? I don't. Well, I, I can't imagine creating documents on my phone, um, but it's really? weird. Why? Just People why? do. 
I don't know any and why don't they, why isn't it possible for the technology to work on phones? I, maybe because it's app-based more than, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I really don't, that's a good question. Um, and, you know, they also include the Windows 10 app and then the availability on the web. So if you're using Office 365 and you're opening up your docs in, in Word using Office 365 or PowerPoint or so on, yes, you have that accessibility checker in there. So we encourage you to use it. Benefits of using these tools. And the initial benefits of using AI, such as the accessibility checker in Microsoft, is that it'll find things that you might have overlooked. And I say that because in that way, because it really should be a tool just to help you ensure accessibility of your documents, but not one that you're 100% reliant upon to identify the accessibility because we want you to learn what you need to do with what elements you need to put in your documents to make them accessible and then just use the accessibility checker as you know this this double check of your work <laughs> and that that goes to um, the challenges the biggest challenge I felt in using AI to create accessible digital materials is it can seem more time consuming. And I say seem, because if you don't proactively include accessibility elements in your documents, it's going to, you're gonna be generating a big list when you, like you're gonna do all this work on this document, right? And then you're gonna have this big list when you do your accessibility checker because you were using tables with merge cells and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> and, um, or maybe not using alt text or things like that. So if you use those things up front, it just makes you know the the act of checking it with the accessibility checker a lot easier, and 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 it takes up a lot less time, in my opinion, because you're not for reformatting a document entirely. You're just fixing a couple little things. So being proactive is is definitely important. Um, we also need to be alert to AI used for design and visual elements. Uh, one example is the PowerPoint designer, and I'm sure they're going to be improving this in the future. Um, it's that, that little design tool in PowerPoint that makes sure your uh, PowerPoints look really wonderfully professional. What it's doing in the process is if you have like bulleted text and it puts your bulleted text in these graphical elements, a screen reader can't read those unless you tag you you tag them or you add the alt text to them. So it mm -hmm. is making more work for you. Originally, I used to say I'd start with a separate document and have your your accessible, boring version of your presentation and then your your wowed presentation for the one you deliver. But I do believe now, like after looking at this from looking even just at this presentation that I'm giving you now, um, I have been able to go in to the accessibility checker and go down those items that need additional text or alt, alt text descriptions, ordering, things like that. And you can, you can make it accessible again, but you do have to be leery of, you know, using something that is based on visual elements. It's, its priority is making something look good visually and your priority is making it look accessible after the fact. So at least that's my priority. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions about that? Before I go to the final challenge, the final challenge is, um, oh, and I, one thing I didn't mention as well is I had gone over the other day about using Gamma for presentations about um, the, the AI product Gamma, which can make your presentations for you. <laughs> when you export that information to PowerPoint, it exports it in a bunch of graphical elements also, which need to be navigated. And if you wanna move them around, it's not as easy as having a PowerPoint with a template. So it's a give and take when you're using AI elements and trying to ensure accessibility, I believe. 
Alan, do you have anything you would like to add about that? No? Okay, good. good <laughs> final, the final challenge is understanding the perspectives of the audience and that that perspective, those perspectives do that vary significantly. And there are things that you can do. And I've gone over this in, in other workshops that will address all perspectives and provide universal design or inclusive design for your documents and, um, and help us address the goal of student equity access and success at, at, at our university. So just a little uh, recap of the impact of inclusive design. And this is another one of those uh, slides where I had three bullets and it gave me these pretty graphics with this, these boxes and all this stuff, right? That's something that I have to go back into and make sure is accessible for a screen reader after I've had the AI generate it. So, um, so increased engagement. Um, Everyone differs in how they interpret and perceive information and designing with all people in mind, as I just said earlier, makes it accessible to a greater number of students, staff, and faculty. Higher success, it's not just student success, it's staff and faculty success as well. We have staff on board and, and faculty who, if we're not creating accessible documents, they're not getting the information we're disseminating to the community and we want everybody to be able to access those materials. So creating an environment where all people feel respected and included will create a community where everyone is welcome and have higher success. And, and that will contribute to the improved campus climate. So it's I can't stress enough how important it is to advocate and participate in using inclusive design because by doing that, you're celebrating diversity and equity and inclusion and having a supportive campus environment. So um, <laughs> that's my ideal <laughs> perspective of that. And, um, and we hope everybody is willing to work toward that. So if you have any questions or want to talk more about making your content accessible, um, I'm happy to, to meet with you. You could email learningdesign at umb.edu or you could book a consult. We just had our, our website changed. So I, I don't have the direct link to book a consult. Do you have it, Ellen? Uh, the might... direct link to book, you know, it's funny. I was closing tabs not too long ago and I closed <laughs> that one. Uh, I'll, I'll get it. I, we, I will. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it is on our website and um, it's a lot of in a lot of our signatures at, at the learning design team. So um, uh, but if I'm all else fails, just it, email learning design at umb.edu and about we're to happy to help. It's in the chat. Wonderful. Thanks, Ellen. You're welcome. And this and other uh, recordings will be available on our YouTube channel as well. So um, Thank you for coming today. I know this has been like a bit of a shorter presentation, but you know, packed with cool information and gives you some free time to maybe go and explore that information. So we encourage you to do that. And if you'd like to stay and talk with us uh, more, I'm happy to, to stay, but we'll stop the recording and I'm gonna stop the share. <laughs>